Okay. So it's been a few weeks and um, the last the last time we went through John uh, John 16, 1 through 15, and we talked about uh, a few things. Um, we talked about Jesus was revealing um, the coming persecution, uh, and Jesus was revealing the coming Holy Spirit. And basically, I, I broke this up into three conversations or three separate parts of a longer conversation. Um, and that was the first part of the conversation was one through 15. And just to go over those sub points, Jesus um, revealed to them that conflict would come to them from the world. That that and and we just you kind of see that whenever you stand up for the truth uh you're going to get resistance um and then uh, he talks about the persecution he basically says you're gonna they're gonna put you out of the synagogue which means there and we've talked about this before the synagogue was a, the center of jewish society so you're basically going to be kicked out of the synagogue they'll kill you um, and you're going to be looked on as being enemies of God and then after he talks to them about this he also reveals the coming of the Holy Spirit and he talks about the uh, prerequisite of this Jesus says that he has to go away in order for the spirit to come that's God's plan as part of the new covenant. And then we see he talks about the purpose of that is that he, the Holy Spirit is going to accomplish a, four, a fourfold purpose. The first is to convict sinners. The second is to condemn Satan. The other is to counsel the saints. And the other is to, the fourth is to champion Christ, to witness and bear witness of Christ. So that's the first part of this chapter, 1 through 15. Then we have the second part of this, which is 16 through 28. And Pat, why don't I have you, since you're our official reader, go ahead and read verses 16 through 28. Okay, but if it sounds like I have something in my mouth, it might be the ice cream, just so you know. That's okay. All right. So this is 15, right? 16. That was on the wrong chapter. Okay. Yes. 16, 16. I'm sorry, 16, 16? Yeah, chapter 16, verse 16 through 28. Got it, got it. Okay, a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will, and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the father and because I go to the father rather. So they were saying, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, are you deliberate? Excuse me. Are you deliberating together together about this? That I said a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. So truly, truly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of, a jo of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you wish the Father, excuse me, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name 
ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into this into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. And I think you said to verse 28, is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So there's three aspects to this second conversation that I want to talk about. If you want to write them down, you can. The first is the confusion. And that is verses 16 through 18. The confusion. The second is the clarification. And that is verses 19 through 22. And then the third part of this is the comfort, which is verses 23 through 28. So the confusion here we see in 16 through 18, a little while you will no longer see me. And then again, a little while and you will see me. And some of the disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he is telling us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the father. So they were saying, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. So they were not, they just simply weren't grasping the aspect of, uh, of the death and resurrection of Christ. Again, they are operating, they are operating on the Jewish theology of that time that said the Messiah would come and he would overthrow the Romans. He would overthrow the Gentile world and set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. So they're, they're not putting together this little while, you're, you're not going to see me, a little while you'll see me. And they just, they don't understand that. And so the disciples, they just don't understand what Jesus is saying. In just a little while, I'll be gone and you'll see me. Um, so Jesus has to clarify this to them. Again, Jesus, when he is preaching to, for three years to, to the Jewish people at this time, there's a lot of bad theology and a lot of misconceptions about who the Messiah was going to be and how God was going to affect the coming of the millennial kingdom. So Christ is stepping into this and he's trying to restore true theology but he's not he's not only trying to restore right thinking he's also trying to reveal hidden mysteries so a lot of this stuff was simply hidden yeah, but he's trying to reveal it to him those who believed and trusted him listened to what he had to say but even the disciples still couldn't put together all the pieces and it's understandable that they couldn't put all the pieces together. The interesting thing that I think of is I wonder if Jesus were to come today, what kind of misconceptions would he have to deal with in the church? I always wonder about that. What, you know, would the church accept him? So, he is dealing with two different things here, okay? He's dealing with a, a uh,
he's dealing with a, a, a people who are, who only have part of the picture. And they have taken scripture and they've created a legalistic society and they've, mis they've misrepresented. So he's dealing with a representation of theology that is not a correct. And then he has to deal with a revealing of mysteries long foretold. I'm going to write that down. See? Okay, um, so and so we can't be too judgmental about the disciples during this time, but at the same time, um, a lot of a lot of the bad theology that was going around was due to man's disobedience, ego, and refusal to take God at His word and a refusal to live by faith. And that's that's never a, a good thing. So we have this confusion. So then we have this clarification that comes in verses 19 through 22. Jesus knew that they wished to question him and he said to them, so they're, they're, they're confused, okay? Um, but this is interesting. They're, they're confused, but they don't want to, they don't want to ask Jesus to, they don't want to admit to Jesus they're confused and say, I, we don't know what the heck you're talking about. And that's just kind of a spiritual pride. You know, we can come to God and say, I have no idea. We don't have to pretend to know something that we don't know. And so he knew that they were confused. And he said, um, Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to her child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that the child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice. And no one will be able to take that joy from you. So there's a few things here in this explanation. One is that this taking away is his death. And he tells them that it's going to be very difficult for them because their whole world and see, again, the problem was not their faith. The problem was their understanding. The problem was their knowledge. They had limited knowledge in regards to what the Messiah was going to do. And even though Jesus had told them repeatedly that he was going to be crucified, it still wasn't registering with them because it did not fit their theological scheme. It didn't fit the theology that they had been taught all their lives. So Jesus is telling them, you're not going to see me anymore, which is a reference to his death. And that is going to cause you great grief. And the other part of that is that it's going to cause the world great joy. But that's very short-lived. Because the other part of this, he says, you will see me again. He says, he says in a little while, and the verbiage there means a very short span of time. So, 
you're not going to see me. And then three days later, you're going to see me. And when, when, when you don't see me, it's going to cause you great grief. And when you see me again, it's going to cause you great joy. And he described the joy in a few ways. One is he compares it to a woman giving birth, which we, my, my daughter-in-law is going to be giving birth in June to my first grandchild. And this Saturday, we found out it's going to be a baby girl. They did the gender reveal with Star Wars lightsabers. A pink lightsaber for girl and a blue lightsaber. You got to know my son. So anyway, um, he, he compares it to a woman who is in labor and there's pain and there's crying and there's distress. But once the baby is born, the pain is gone. And the joy of a new life, which will remain, replaces it. And in, in the other part that I find interesting here is he says, therefore, you have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take that joy from you. So this joy is not a worldly joy. This joy is something, this joy is something that is not based in situation. Um, many times our happiness can be based upon our situation, upon our circumstances. This joy is not based on circumstance. This joy is based on an absolute, um, unrevocable fact, promise, hope that is not something that we conjure ourselves or is given to us through circumstance or situation, but it is a joy that is a sovereign gift of God, who is the person of Christ, that can never be taken from us. No situation or circumstance can steal, diminish, or extinguish that joy. And that, that is what makes the Christian life so powerful when it's lived in the joy of the Lord, which is why Paul says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Or was that psalm? one of the two does that make sense okay so uh that's something that it's important for us to understand then verses 23 through 28 so he gives he, there's the confusion there's the clarification and then there's the comfort and the comfort is verses 23 through 28 in that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for it. So let me stop for a second on that Um in that day, you will not question me about anything. What do you think he means by that?
anyone view is, is he saying that uh, because in that day what we we will have the answers to our questions those those answers will be revealed to us at that point yeah i mean that basically yeah um, the disciples had gone through three years of what, 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 huh, huh, huh? And when the Holy Spirit comes, they go from what, 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 huh, 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 to aha, aha, aha. It all starts making sense. And so right now where they seem to be, uh, uh, is Reed sleeping? He looks like he's sleeping. <laughs> Wake up, Reed. <laughs> I thought he fell out of the chair there for a second. <laughs> that would have been fun to ball because then he went up. Um, the disciples have spent three years, you know, getting everything wrong and what is this and I don't know. And then you do notice a dramatic shift after Pentecost where they know exactly what they're talking about. So He's saying, you know, it's the time is coming. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. So what is the context there? What is the context there? Because some of our charismatic friends will take that verse. If you ask anything in my Father's name, he'll give it to you. And they say, oh, well, see, I want a Mercedes Benz. What is this? What's the context? Well, the context is that by that time, they'll have the Holy Spirit. So they'll be able to communicate to uh, God, Jesus, you know, the headship or whatever, uh, through the Holy Spirit. So. They, but what is, what is, okay, let me, and, what, and what that, are they, what are they asking for? What's the context of their ask? Well, their ask was always about his resurrection. They were always asking about his death because they never really truly understood it. And then well, it, it's broader than that. It's broader than that. I mean, you're on the right track. You're definitely on the right track, but it's broader than that. It's wisdom. It's biblical understanding. It's gospel knowledge. He's, what does he say? In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say that now that's all in reference to the questioning. If you ask, see, you will not remember. He just said, you will not ask me anything. He said, if you ask anything in the Father's name, he will give it to you. The context, I argue here, is biblical understanding and knowledge. Not about a mansion or a Mercedes or wealth. It's about biblical, spiritual understanding. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. Why? So that your joy may be fulfilled. Now, what is now? Remember when he first brought up the word, guys? This is why biblical study is so important to learn how to link the context together. When he says, "So that your joy will be complete." When he first brought up the concept of a joy that no one can take from you, what did that joy have to do with? Did it have to do with, if I pray for health, wealth, and prosperity? No, the joy is that Jesus has, you know, saved us, right? It's the resurrection. Yeah. It's the knowledge of salvation. It is the knowledge of the gospel. I'm done with that. Yeah. And I think it's super important to keep 
these verses within the context because so many of these verses are twisted in churches today to support prosperity doctrine. I know because I've heard it preached that way. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language and hours coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. So he did speak in a lot of parables and that kind of thing. But I will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name and I do not and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed me that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. So the comfort here is in two things. One, Jesus reveals that the Father will give them all that they need because of what the Son has done. And again, a lot of these verses are used for prosperity, but these verses are talking about spiritual, biblical, gospel, knowledge, and joy. Not prosperity. And then Jesus also reassures them and comforts them by how? Telling them that their, their relationship is directly with the Father. That they can, as Paul says, boldly approach the throne of grace. There is no more curtain separating the Holy of Holies anymore. It's been ripped into and we walk into the presence of God. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Well, maybe not. You know what? Maybe I can finish. First. Let's finish chapter 16. I think I can get this uh, third conversation here. Um, so the third part of this, uh, Robert, why don't you read John 16, 29 through 33? Then we can finish up chapter 16. <clears throat> sure. John 16, 29 to 33. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and not using a fear of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Okay, so in this last conversation, we have two points here. From 29 to 30, the disciples speak. And from 31 to 33, Jesus speaks. So the disciples say, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using the figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have, now get this, and have no need for anyone to question you. What do they mean by that? Now we know that you know all things. Now only God knows all things and have no need for anyone to question you. What are they saying? Sounds like they're just recognizing his uh, his authority on this. He doesn't need anybody to question him because he knows what he's talking about. 
Yeah, and the, but there's yeah. another part. There's another part of that too. And I don't. But they to... recognize that he is God. Yes, they're recognizing they say... that. They're starting to recognize that because they say he comes from God. They didn't actually say, he, you know, if, he is so, God. Okay. So Pat, I come to your work and I get a job as a. Uh, Is it a technical writer? Yes. Okay. Which I would make a horrible technical writer, but let's say I get a job as the, and 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 so I'm like, hey Pat, thanks for the job. And you're like, okay, Tony, listen now. Just sit here and just kind of do what I tell you. And every time you tell me something, I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. Shouldn't we do it this way? That doesn't make sense. Shouldn't we do it that way? And then I finally come to the point where I go, oh, he kind of knows what he's doing. I just shouldn't question him. I should just follow. Right. So it, it, it has a greater breadth to it than just realizing his authority. They're realizing he can be trusted and he doesn't need to be questioned. He needs to be followed. He just needs to be trusted. And, and that's when they say, now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this, we believe you came from God. So it's more than just realizing his authority it's trusting in his character. Jesus answered them, and what does he say? What does he say when they say, now we know, one, you know all things. Two, we don't need to keep questioning you. Three, because you came from God. What is, it, what is his response? Now do you believe. That, folks, is saving faith. You recognize the authority of Christ. You place your faith in the character, the blood, the work of Christ. And you acknowledge that he's come from the Father. Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered. And basically now he's telling them the bad news is that you're all, all going to be scattered. But don't worry. I basically, what he's telling him, he says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? For I have overcome the world. Look, there are going to be times, there are going to be times when you are going to scatter and run to your home. And there are going to be times when you stand in the middle of Jerusalem or on the or, or on Mars Hill and preach the gospel. But whatever those times may be, we can we will live through them because Christ has overcome. And he is the one that has brought our salvation. He is the one that holds our soul. He is the one that our identity is in. And the disciples are just grabbing onto this. And they won't, they won't fully understand it until Pentecost, but they're just grabbing, starting to grab onto this. Okay, that's chapter 16. Okay, I have a question for you. Um, yes, sir. Feels like a dumb one. Because you, you kind of started in on it. Um, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, this is in verse 23, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. And we know that isn't about us being able to manipulate whatever we want out of God just by knowing how to talk to him right or go to his mother first or anything like that. 
I, I, I don't think I'm fully clear on exactly what that's supposed to mean. Well, the context, okay. Let's look at the, the context of it. Um, following the conversation that, that, that Jesus is having, um, before that, uh, he says, in that day, so when the Holy Spirit comes, um, you will not question me about anything. People who question are people who do not know. People who question are sometimes people who do not trust. Depends on what angle your question is coming from. But he says what? He says what? Right after he says that, he says, truly, truly. You cannot separate that from what he just said, in that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. So the context of this is the knowledge of the gospel. It is the knowledge of God. It is the, it is the ability to communicate and preach and teach and evangelize. And God will always be willing to give us anything that we ask when we ask about basically having more knowledge of him. And then it then he says, the next thing is, until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. And again, the joy is linked to the giving of God through the resurrection, which is the knowledge of the gospel and the power over sin. All of this is, in other words, look, this ask God and he'll give you anything can only mean two things. It either means God is a genie in a bottle, or it means that you're asking him about something that has nothing to do with the flesh. So what the question is, what are you asking him for? We all know that it can't be if you ask him for wealth, health, prosperity, he'll give it to you. We all know that's bunk. So what could what 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 is it? What does that leave? It leaves spiritual knowledge, sanctification, spiritual fruit being born in our life. Everything that pertains to your development as a believer, God wants to give to you. He withholds nothing from you. The problem is people read these verses and they want it to read, uh, uh, oh, oh, I want a vacation home. I want riches. I want health. I want wealth. I want prosperity. I want a jet. You know, and that's what these Joel Olsteins and Benny Hens and these snakes are selling. And they use verses like this and they use them out of context because they have no understanding of the gospel, and they don't want any understanding of the gospel. Yes, Amy, I see your hand. By the read, by the way, Reed is still listening. He's just. Oh, I thought I thought he might have passed out. <laughs> fell off, finally, fell off the chair. Is he laying on the floor underneath the table, listening? Is that no? <laughs> In the other area, anyway. Just so you know. Um, so, but couldn't like God sometimes want certain people to have a lot of money because of his, the ministry that they're supposed to do? So, I mean, it's not like money for money's sake, but like, you know, they're well, praying. That, okay. God, God's sovereign distribution of our lives is different from ask anything of God and he'll give it to you. Right. 
so but it could include money for some for some people because depending on what god wants for them well, if god sure god could bless you with money but 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 that's not what this verse is talking about okay um but it's if it's talking about like growing in the lord right okay well hold on so if, if it says, ask anything of God and he'll give it to you, so then ask for a million dollars and he'll give it to you, if that's what it means. No. It either, it either means it or it doesn't. If someone is blessed by God to have money, and then there's a responsibility with that, that has nothing to do with them asking about it like God is a genie. That has to do with God's plan in their life. Oh, okay. So this verse would be more about God. Um, uh, okay, I'm asking God to um, build His plan in my life, and, and everything, everything that the, the disciples were asking Christ was a, to understand what God was going to do and what their responsibility was, right. and what salvation was, and what the kingdom was. They were they were never asking Christ give us money. Right, right. I get it. I get it. So it's just yeah, I got it. The only the only one that was involved for the money was Judas, and we know how that turned out. Yep. So Tony, what, what does it mean to to live the abundant life? Is is that the same thing then? It's basically the access to the biblical knowledge. Is that abundant? Yeah, the, listen, the abundant life is simply living a life of faith that honors God and seeks to glorify Christ through, through the proclamation of the gospel. Now, whether, whether you're rich or living under a bridge, mm. that has no bearing on you having joy or an abundant life. There's lots of, in fact, I would say the great majority of true Christians in the world live in abject poverty. China, Africa, India greatly outnumber true so, Christians. Yeah, so what is America, the abundance? And they live in abject poverty. Yeah, so abundance means abundance in in the in the fruits of the spirit, or what, what does it mean? Abundance in in yeah, in the fruit of the spirit, the abundance of joy, of peace, mm -hmm. of patience, of long suffering, the abundance of the community of Christ, of brothers and sisters in Christ, and having a family that you're all connected to with the Holy Spirit. This uh, the abundance of growing in your knowledge knowledge of who God is, what the gospel is, what the Bible says, all of this, it's emotional, it's spiritual, and it's intellectual. Mm -hmm. All of that is in abundance, and it, and it does not, that's why Paul says, I have learned to be content, whether in feasting or in famine, in much or in need. He says that that has no bearing on my happiness or abundance of life, These those things. If I have plenty of food, great. If I don't have enough food, that's okay too. That This has nothing, uh, no bearing on my contentment. Contentment comes when you find your, your, your identity in Christ, your security in his work, and you learn to live in the joy of the fruit of the spirit of sanctification and growing in the abundance of God's glory. And, and that is always accessible to every Christian, or it can yeah. be times yeah. when when it's it's not. That that's the sad thing about the prosperity gospel is that it's basically teaching your relationship and abundant life with God is all about how much money you have or how healthy mm. you are. And obviously. Not everyone's going to be rich or healthy. So what does that do now? 
all of those people are cut out from having the joy of abundant life. Why? Because their focus, what they've been told the abundant life is, is a lie. 